I'm Don Norman. This is the Design Lab, and welcome to the Design Lab. Um, this is the Design at Large Symposium. And what happened was this weekend, I got an email from Jordan Crandell, the Chair of Visual Arts, saying, hey, we have this interesting group of people coming. Uh, how would you like to have them give a talk? Wasn't much advance notice. <laughs> So as you've probably all experienced, we flooded everybody we could think of with all the emails, and here you are. So I'm delighted to introduce the ScanLab people, but since I barely know them, I will introduce Benjamin Bratton from the Visual Arts, who will introduce them. It was a conference with Liam Young for you. It was a really, really fantastic conference, amazing people, and I thought that the work that they showed and the participation was, was the most memorable thing at the entire event. And when we were thinking about who we might want to bring in for this particular series, they were absolutely top of our top of our list. As we begin. And so, the talk that they're doing is part of a um, it was a continuation of, of, of an initiative that Jordan and I put together with UC Parica, Ryan Bishop, uh, 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 Ed Keller, uh, uh, Mackenzie Wark, and part of this uh, consortium that we that we, that we provide. And it's on sensing and sensation. We call it. And the basic big idea is that we're looking at ways in which what we now call, what we think of as machine sensing, and machine vision, and natural sensation, how it is that we ourselves, as you know, body creatures, uh, uh, sense the world. How it is that certain kinds of technologies uh, are interweaving, linking these together in new ways, such that we think it's sort of synthetic sensation and natural sensation are beginning to link. And what does this mean for art, philosophy, phenomenology, and also for design and engineering? And so, you know, things like, Todd Coleman's epidermal microelectronics is a good example, Joe Wang's uh, biosensors. And here it's really hard to sort of separate what's the technology and what's the body at the level of the sensation. But one of the key things, especially for art as well, is machine vision. And how it is that non-animal creatures see the world. That we, we think of it and categorize and talk about as if it's a vision, but maybe it's really something else besides this. Maybe it's which something we don't have a name for yet. Um, but uh, it's uh, extraordinarily uh, interesting. A lot of our students have developed uh, projects and practices that make use of these questions in, in particular ways. The, the thing I would ask you to sort of think about while we're looking at the extraordinary work is that uh, we may think of scanning, surveillance, photography, take, you know, somehow capturing uh, or mapping an environment um, as uh, maybe the first thing that we see. But as you go deeper into the work, you begin to see some of the more, some of the more, I think, more extraordinary provocative projects. It becomes very clear that, that the work that the work, that we, work that they do and the way they use LIDAR is not just as a capturing, scanning, or surveillance tool. It's a compositional device. It's not just about describing the world in a particular way. It's about producing, uh, producing a way of seeing the world producing figures and forms and temporalities and conditions that could not be produced under any other circumstances. And to me, that's why uh, their practice really is one that operates at a first principles uh, level. And so, so it's my real pleasure to, to hand it over to Matthew um, Scanlon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, so I'll just start by saying thanks to Benjamin and to Jordan and uh, everybody for having us here today. It's a real honor to present to you guys and to um, have the opportunity to, to do a little talk today, but also to, to put the exhibition on in the gallery space and to be running a workshop over uh, the course of Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, which I believe is going to be open to everybody. Is that all right? Uh, our, our best students. Our best ones. Cool. OK. <laughs> um, so thanks, thanks very much for, for the invitation, and we're just uh, really honored to be here. Um, I'm going to start um, in slightly scary form today, because um, ScanLab kind of came out of... Uh, ScanLab uh, started to come into existence about five and a half years ago, when myself and a colleague, at, um, a, or a recent graduate from the Bartlett School of Architecture, Will Trossel, had started to um, experiment with LiDAR as a, as a new way of seeing the world. Um, it really got quite serious in a pub. Um, about four and a half years ago when I bumped into the guy who's now sat in the shorts and flip-flops in the front row, um, Till Wagner, who, or Dr. Till Wagner, as he is now, um, who is a CI scientist, um, at the time was doing his PhD at Cambridge University. Um, a kind of half an hour conversation with Till um, uh, 
kind of enlightened me to the fact that he was going here, which is uh, within the Arctic Circle. We're at about 79 degrees north here. Um, so he was off to this place. Uh, he was taking all sorts of interesting pieces of technology. One piece of technology that he was potentially taking was a, was a LiDAR scanner, um, which I think it's fair to say you guys had kind of limited success using before. Um, you, told me, you told me about this machine as if there were, you know, there were only 30 of them in the UK at the time. Just out of interest, Matt likes machines. He might uh, be interested in this machine. I happened to have one of them under my desk at the time. We just started to experiment with it. Ten days later, we found ourselves flying out to Svalbard, which is an island off the north coast of Norway, and then meeting the Greenpeace ship, um, the Arctic Sunrise, which took us here. The Green this is the Greenpeace ship. Um, it took us here into the, into the ice pack um, to start collecting a series of information for ongoing um, research at the Department for Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics, is that right? Um, at Cambridge University. Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth about what those CS scientists are doing with that information because there's two of them in the front row. Um, <laughs> but um, so far as, uh, as we kind of learnt over the course of two years going on expeditions with, with, with Cambridge, um, their investigations start actually on a scale much, much grander than this slide suggests here. So um, they're using remote sensing technologies to understand the kind of um, the, the, the structure of sea ice on a kind of continental scale, really. Um, our expeditions would, would kind of come in, actually, and, and the scan lab work would, would take place on much more this sort of scale. So what we would do is we would moor the ship up to a single ice flow. We would then clamber down onto the surface of the ice um, and set up. This is the, the old Faro um, terrestrial laser scanner um, called the Photon 120. We would set it up on the surface of the ice and we would, um, we would produce a 3D model which would, uh, over the course of a kind of long day's work, look something like this. So this is about 11 individual scan positions. The little dots here are the shadow underneath the machine. So you, you see it here on, on the tripod. It's, it's mapping in 3D a 360 degree by 335 degree sphere of information and it's missing this little spot just underneath. Okay. So what we're doing, um, I'll go into how the technology works in a little bit more detail in a second, but the purpose of these trips um, is to capture highly accurate 3D um, morphological information about the top surface of these pieces of ice. Um, these kind of act as, as, as test sites which are located and known within data sets that then are mapped through aerial photography and then are mapped through satellite imagery. So, so these kind of test units on this sort of scale of an individual flow t uh, spiral out into that much, much larger data set. Some of these pieces of ice were, the, the, the previous one probably took about a day to scan. Uh, we were also um, very lucky and uh, qu uh, quite kind of terrifyingly allowed the opportunity to go off in the helicopter on those trips as well, so we would be dropped down onto these kind of very, very fragile individual pieces of ice that might be about 500 millimeters thick um, in a kind of this is kind of the, um, the peripheral ice zone, I think. Am I right in saying the, the sorry, marginal ice zone? Um, so it's where pieces of ice are forming and breaking up, forming and breaking up on a very, very regular basis. So you can just see here we've been dropped off by helicopter. I think these are helicopter tracks on this ice floor here. Um, oh, no, sorry. He helicopter tracks over here. And then we've been jumping over this kind of, kind of little piece here and scanning this piece of ice as well. And this... Um, this top surface information, this three-dimensional information, is tied to a whole series of, of much more traditional um, scientific measurements that were being taken on the ice there. So thickness measurements, core samples for salinity. I just let this play as well. Um, and we ended up over the course of two expeditions over two years with a set of 21 individual ice flows, which vary from the size of a football stadium down to a kind of basketball court. All all top surface measured to within an accuracy of probably about five to ten centimeters. I'd say five centimeters. Normally we'd be down to kind of two or three millimeter detail of resolution, but you're wobbling around a bit. Um, there's polar bears and there's all sorts of kind of things that make the process slightly more interesting than scanning in the street in London. Um, and so we, what's fascinating about this project for me is that 
we then, really our job was done at, at the stage of, of tying this information together and actually delivering it to Till and the other scientists as these rather, in our eyes, depressing spreadsheets of numbers, basically. X, Y, Z positions, uh, Till being particularly interested in the distance in the Z um, from zero, zero, which in that case was water level, basically. So these things, um, uh, as I understand it, in their, their most useful form were used in programs like MATLAB, um, basically analysis. Um, and myself and Will are trained as architect. Everybody that's worked at ScanLab has always had a kind of architectural and design background. And we were, in a way, devastated <coughs> by the idea that this beautiful, um, kind of compelling um, fragment of a landscape that completely disappears the day that we leave it, it changes, those, those peripheral ice pieces change <coughs> within a matter of hours, um, would end up kind of... Uh, only enlightened through mathematics, as opposed to slightly more visual, um, visual means. Um, we started kind of reflecting on that trip. This is one of the first drawings that were produced about that trip, which is a, um, it's a distorted polyconic projection of the world, which gives a complete bias only to the moments of the Earth that we, <coughs> the, the, the pieces of the Earth that the expedition came into contact with. So the expedition path is undistorted, essentially, and everything else around the world pales in significance to, in comparison to those areas that we went to. Um, and it was about the stage of doing this drawing that we were um, lucky enough to be given the opportunity to put on an exhibition at the Architectural Association Gallery in London. Um, the moment Will and I were, were st stepped foot together on the, on the ship of the Arctic Sunrise, we were like, what the hell can we do with this data? And the first ridiculous notion was, well, we've got to make these icebergs again, or these ice flows again, out of ice. Like, we have to, we have to refabricate these things somewhere. Um, and the AA were foolish enough, or wise enough, or somewhere in between, to give us that opportunity. So we put on the show um, called Frozen Relic, and it literally recreated these ice flows, at a scale of 1 to 100, um, within the gallery space. It was in January 2000, and I'm going to get this wrong, 13. Um, and for five weeks, um, the gallery space would be filled with a series of seven of the, of the 21 ice flows that we captured. They were cast in ice. They would arrive in the gallery space. Um, and then they would disisappear, uh, quite obviously. Um, I'll just talk briefly through the kind of making process of, of making these objects. And one of the things that I'll um, explain almost immediately as well is there's a scaling issue going on here in the z-axis. It's something that Till and the guys do to be able to understand the differences in morphology, because this is essentially a kind of pancake-like landscape. Everything is pretty flat and thin, so everything is exaggerated. In, in the instance of our, um, of our objects, they're all scaled by seven in the, in the z-axis. So these things are actually much, much more flatter and pancake-like than they appear in the objects here. It also gave us the practicalities of making pieces of ice that would last longer than five minutes. Um, <laughs> So top surface information was very, very accurate. It came from the, from the terrestrial laser scanning. At this stage, the information that we captured for the underside was based on drill holes. So it was a pretty kind of, it, it, there were section lines, basically, of information taken through the ice and, and this kind of gridded pattern. So the undersides became a little bit more interpolated and there was a little bit, actually, of kind of creative license going into those forms on the underside there as well. We ended up with this motley crew of, of, of positives, which were silicon molded. We then spent most of December and early January in minus 40 degrees in the shipping container freezer in Hackney Wick on the edge of London. More time in minus temperatures then than we did in the Arctic when we were actually doing this. Um, oh, I have lost control. And, and what we also did, uh, so, so these, these moulds will be filled with water. We also, um, we, um, we spent this kind of crazy process of trying to understand how ice freezes as well here. Um, because, you know, some of the, the smallest pieces at 1 to 100, about this sort of size, that sort of thickness, the largest one was over a metre by a metre, and it was half a metre thick. Um, to fill that thing up with water and, and let it freeze, even at minus 40, takes days and days and days. We didn't actually want to set ourselves that task, though. We didn't just want these things frozen. In the first instance, we wanted them perfectly, transparently frozen. To freeze ice transparently, you need to freeze it incredibly, incredibly slowly. If it freezes quickly, you get big crystals in it, and that refracts the light, and you end up with white ice. Um, I think that's 
see our standards, help me out. Um, so we spent a lot of time um, actually making very, very slowly freezing ice so that it was perfectly clear. So we would um, so we'd make, make clear stock ice. We would do this by filling up. We, we, we bought pre-filtered water. We would then boil it twice. We would filter it. We would cool it down to just above zero. <coughs> we would then fill up our molds with it. We would circulate the water inside those molds so that it so that it was always moving. So it would freeze very, 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 very slowly. We'd come in in the morning. We'd um, carve out the pumps which had frozen in overnight and start the process again. And and in the end, we ended up with these um, replicas that we were incredibly, incredibly pleased with. The top surface there, you can see our footprints in the miniature versions of the snow. And then these things would disappear. Uh, and, and this was one of the most amazing things about this show actually is that you'd have this moment of like perfectness and it would disappear within seconds. And on opening night about 400 people came to this show. That room got, in, that, the, so we opened the windows, we had a cold January, um, uh, but we obviously didn't want to you know refrigerate this room or anything that would have been ridiculous. This is a project with green bees. Um, <laughs> so we, we you know we let these things do what they do and on opening night 400 people came into that room and it melted very very quickly the largest pieces of ice I think in the first set lasted just over two days if if few people went into that room it was freezing in there if we brought a new piece of ice in the smaller pieces of ice around it would last for an extra day because a large piece of ice in that space would cool the temperature down enough to keep these small pieces of ice alive and we were seeing in a very kind of simplistic terms, these exact things that the people on the ship with us, the experts, were telling us: if these large pieces of ice melt during the summer, during or they're not big enough during the summer to keep the rest of the ice around them cold enough to survive the summer, then there's this kind of um, epic melting process that happens. And we were seeing that kind of happen in the in the gallery space as well. I'm going to whiz through to a little bit of a video. We just, uh, two years later, started to finally document the, this project. Um, so one of the most lovely things, actually, about this was the... Um, was this kind of perpetual dripping that just filled the gallery space. We thought we would have to mic up the ice and, and really accentuate the sounds, but just the natural dripping and melting of these objects gave that whole piece a real kind of sound effect. Okay, so watch, watch this space for a kind of 10 minute semi um, documentary about the, the Arctic trips, but also the making of that expedition, which is, which is kind of coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, I wanted to start with that project because it kind of hopefully defines how ScanLab operate um, with this technology. We don't, we, we try to avoid going out, doing some scanning and being done with it. Um, we see the act of going to wherever we're going as, as a kind of completely fundamental part of, of, of our practice. By being exposed to these incredible places, we try and learn as much as we can about those places and then Crucially, kind of as designers, we want to make some sort of reaction to those space that just happens to be through the eyes of a of a lidar machine. Um, but we definitely see this kind of, the kind of capture as the provocation and and, and kind of um, instigation for a design process. So um, I'll whiz through this. A whole bunch of you guys probably know how terrestrial lidar works. I will give you a very very quick run through. So we use a machine that looks nowadays much more user friendly than that one in the Arctic. Um, it sits on a tripod, has a little mirror that spins around, and we've basically got a pulse of infrared light, which is bouncing off that mirror, hitting a point on a surface, and then the whole instrument rotates round. So you're measuring points in an arc, and then the instrument moves round 180 degrees. This process can take a, as quick as a minute, as long as two hours, depending on how many points you're measuring and how accurately you want to measure those points. So you end up with a data set which, which um, kind of, it, it looks like this, it, it looks like some sort of 3D model, but really it's just a collection of points, highly accurately positioned points in space that have a X, a Y, and a Z value by the time they're translated. They, originally they actually have a radial angle value and a, and a distance from the center. They also have another quite interesting piece of information tied to them, which is a quality of reflectivity of the surface that you're 
bouncing the laser off, depending on the wavelengths, you get different reflectivities back. And actually, that reflectivity can be incredibly useful for identifying materials and their reflective properties. Um, we also pr perform a secondary process on site, which is color capture. And then we, we, so we basically take a, a, a very good HDR panoramic image, and we push that color information out onto the spatial information. So we end up with a colored point cloud. So all of those points now have XYZ value, RGB value, and an intensity value. Um, it's infrared. It behaves quite similar to visible light. So if you can see it, we will scan it, essentially. The machines that we tend to use and that we'll be using in the workshop next week has a range of about 300, 330 meters um, in, in both directions. So um, the scans that we were doing here probably took about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and being infrared, it doesn't penetrate through things that you, the visible light can't penetrate through. So you get shadows cast. And the way that we deal with shadows, for example, the shadow cast by this armchair here is that we scan from another position and we link those, those two scans together. There's a whole world of tying things together accurately, spatially, correctly. It's a whole world called surveying. Um, we have spent a fair bit of time learning a lot of these surveying techniques, but it, there's, a, there's a kind of art form to correctly uh, positioning yourself in the world and positioning these scans in the world, which um, on the one hand is something that doesn't fascinate us, on the other hand it's absolutely compelling the, the way that um, humans have, have come to grips with trying to understand the size and form of an object that we live on that's just so vast in comparison to our bodies, you know. So traditionally what we would do is we would move through a space and we, we would scan in different, different areas and we would link those scans together. So this is five scans. Being able to sneak out onto the roof of this property in London, a couple of scans on the roof, a scan out in the street, another scan in the street, and a third scan in the street. So this is 11 scans, about an afternoon you've captured. Um, not just the bricks and mortar of this house, but also um, crucial information about the, the kind of where all the structure is, the relationship between inter internal spaces and external spaces, but also this kind of forensic, um, ruthless look at everything that's there. The scanner doesn't treat a brick to a t-shirt hanging over a, a chair in any different way. They're just surfaces that the, that the laser reflects on. So you get these kind of incredible forensic snapshots of life. That's why the technology is heavily used now in criminal investigations for capturing with an impartial eye everything accurately um, within a scene that can be interrogated and measured and, and analyzed later on. Um, and I think this really kind of, this, um, this kind of uncanny replication of the real world is why we've, we've increasingly started to use LiDAR as a mechanism for telling stories in the practice as well. Um, whiz over these, we can do small stuff as well. This is Nelson's Trafalgar jacket, the one that he was shot in. It's now kept behind bulletproof glass, um, which is <laughs> slightly <laughs> ironic. Um, <coughs> And much larger stuff as well. This is aerial photogrammetry tied together with terrestrial LIDAR. So everything that you can see on the, on the screen here is captured from a small um, computer-controlled um, autonomous uh, little, aer little aeroplane with a drone with a, with a camera inside of it, <coughs> taking a whole series. This is probably about, um, I'm going to guess, I can't actually remember, about 15,000 photos, I would suggest, of this area here. Um, which all have a significant amount of over overlap so that you can use photogrammetric um, software to, to essentially build yourself a 3D model from, from those 2D images. We then tie at this stage that, that um, photogrammetric information to terrestrial LiDAR information. So about now the castle in the, in the foreground here starts to be scanned from the ground. Um, you're looking at tying together kind of aerial information with an accuracy of say five to ten centimeters to LIDAR information with an accuracy here because there's no polar bears um, at about one or two millimeters accuracy. So the practice has um, it's kind of evolved in a few different ways. We teach regularly uh, at the Bartlett School of Architecture. Um, it is a commercial practice. There's myself and Will, Thomas, um, two other Toms and another guy called Soma who worked for us in, in London. Um, we only employ Toms, apart from Soma, which apparently is Tom in Japanese. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, so there's, there's a commercial side to the practice, um, but 
crucially as well, I'd say kind of 40% of our projects make us no money whatsoever. We spend our time doing them because we want to do them and we, they push on the capabilities of what we might do in the next commercial practice and, and the other way around as well. I'm going to play now um, a showreel. So the commercial work tends to take on this kind of visualization um, for various means. They can be collaborations. You know, the best um, commercial project is actually a commercial collaboration with an artist or something like that where we'd be, um, where we're producing a film. Um, and we do a fair bit of stuff for kind of film and TV as well. There's a whole series of projects in there. Um, they range from collaborations with galleries and museums, documenting exhibitions that have been on for 60 years and are being taken down. And the exhibits are 3,000 exhibits going back to their owners that are spread literally across the world, to collaborations which have taken a, just an afternoon with, um, with artists. Or ongoing collaborations is a project which we'll talk about later on, which has been going on for four years now with the dance company. Um, they really, they really, really vary from, from things that end up as filmic pieces to things that end up as sculptures to things that end up as iPad applications or Oculus Rift environments, that sort of thing. And the reason I think that we are so fascinated by this, the, the LiDAR as a technology in particular, is because we, we, and the reason that we're so interested in kind of interrogating it and taking it to its extremes now is that we're seeing its, we're seeing its proliferation or proliferation of similar technologies that are going to be mapping the world perpetually, um, not necessarily for the point of visualization, but, but for, for the point of um, inputting spatial information into machines. So this is a snapshot from Project Tango, which is a Google project launched uh, over a year ago, which essentially puts, it's a different sort of technology, but essentially puts a point cloud creating machine onto everybody's iPhone, um, aligning that information as you wander through your house. So Google have got the inside of your house. Um, <coughs> then every driverless vehicle in the world um, will potentially, there's a bit of an ongoing battle between photogrammetry and, and LiDAR, but LiDAR with a frame rate. So LiDAR that can capture up to 25 frames a second with a range of 200 meters, perpetually mapping the streets around you. So these data sets are already being created, not just by people like us, but by machines that are strolling through the world. And, and we only can ever foresee that, that amount of data capture increasing and increasing and increasing. And we really want to kind of, um, critically engage with that technology as it proliferates and, and as these models of the world become kind of perpetually updated. I'm going to skip over this one, I think, because I'm going a bit slow. Um, so I'll talk through a few projects now. Um, the first one is a collaboration with a group of people who you guys will quite possibly know about, uh, Forensic Architecture, run by A.L. Wiseman and Susan Shipley in, uh, in the UK at uh, Goldsmiths University. Um, 
Forensic architecture do a whole series of incredible projects looking at the spatial remnants of conflict, um, the spatial and architectural remnants um, and the evidence that is left not in necessarily human testimony but in um, geographic and in architectural testimony, testimony that can be used to, to um, understand crimes of the, um, of the recent past. The project that we um, were involved in was, um, was called Living Death Camps. Um, it focused on two uh, previous concentration camps in Europe. Um, the first being this, uh, this is Starish Simister concentration camp on the edge of Belgrade. Um, it was a concentration camp during the Second World War. Um, the other concentration camp uh, is at a place called Amaska, the Amaska Mine, uh, from the recent Balkans conflict. And the reason that these two projects get kind of semi-controversially tied together is that they, they actually both um, are locations which had a history prior to their time as a concentration camp and have ongoing histories as well. And I think one of the important things in this project was to try and understand the significance of this moment in their histories, but also to, to try and um, uh, to shed some light on how an ongoing history of a space like that can be slightly more informed than just being a, a, essentially a museum. Um, so, uh, Starish Simister used to be a fairground. It was actually the site for a world fair. Um, so it's built, it's, 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 a, you know, it's quite a large site, and it's this series of pavilions. So this, for example, is a German pavilion. We have the Hungarian, the, oh, sorry, Hungarian pavilion over here, the Romanian pavilion over here, a whole series of pavilions that had kind of hosted the finest that the world kind of had to show. It was then used um, towards the end of the Second World War uh, by the Nazis as a place of incarceration for particularly local Romani families. Um, we, we, we went together with a, a forensic archaeologist who uses GPR technology, ground penetrating radar, um, trying to capture as much of not only the physical above ground remnants of of this site, but also the below ground remnants of, of the former camp and potential mass grave sites and potential um, previous camp structures. So um, the project, I mean, it's a bit of a deep project to go into the, the, the kind of full story behind it. Um, but what I think one of the most important things was this tying together of what can be seen now, what is actually active now, and, and, and what's evidence now that you can go and witness with your own eyes. And this kind of slightly more mystical layer of evidence that exists underground that is much less, it's much, much less clear and transparent as to what it is. You don't get um, exact millimeter details with GPR. You get forms and, and changes of density. And tying together these kind of ghostly shadows of what's happened previously on the site together with the very real um, now of the site became a very, very interesting kind of um, design methodology, I guess. And, and there's a, there a very kind of creative approach to this project, as well as, as, as the very um, significant scientific contributions that Caroline Sturdy Cole has, has made using this data. Um, and there's w one reason why this project has been pushed artistically is that there are plans now as, as, um, as Serbia joins the EU, one of the requirements is to commemorate the Holocaust. Um, one of the things that they are therefore proposing, one of their major bits of, um, uh, of proposals to commemorate the Holocaust is to turn this place essentially into a museum. So they are reinstating it into its concentration camp uh, form. Um, they're rebuilding some of the buildings and it's gonna become a place to, to visit and to pay your respects. What that means is that the current occupiers of the sites, including a large amount of um, of Serbia's artistic community who have squatted these buildings and then gradually over, over 40, 50, 60 years turned them into their homes. And also, completely ironically, Roma families who've come back settled on this site are being evicted by the government to commemorate the Holocaust. So, so the project has, and this data set has kind of acted as, as a backbone not only for Caroline's um, archaeological research, but also for these, for these conversations about the ridiculousness of these kind of EU-enforced regulations. The project is tied together with this site, as I said, um, uh, from um, a site called the Amaska Mine, um, which, as the name suggests, was a functioning iron ore mine um, before the recent Bosnian conflicts. 
Um, it then became used as a, as a concentration camp and, and, um, and we were given um, the, f the first ever real kind of media access to this site. Um, and we were going in as a film crew um, with our kind of unidentified machine and were completely escorted around this site um, with the permission to make a documentary about this building, which is called the White House. Um, the White House is the sort of building that was, it just became super notorious for people going in and, and not leaving, basically. Um, it was center for torture and for execution during the, this site's time as a, as a camp. Um, one of the kind of crazy things with the LiDAR machine, this is, this is three or four years ago, is that nobody recognizes it, nobody understands what it is. So we would, we would we encircled this building and um, we were setting up the scanner pointing, it points in all directions, framing the White House, but actually scanning the entire mine site or everything that we could do. And these guys are there with permission, just asking us which direction the scanner is, is pointing in. And we're just, it's pointing over there, don't you worry, don't you worry. But this kind of slightly unknown sense of the technology enables <coughs> us to capture a hell of a lot more information than was actually uh, being discussed at the time. Um, the, the reason that, um, that this little fragment of the, of the data becomes so important is that um, local relatives, survivors from this camp, can't go and visit the Amaska mine because it's now, again, it's owned by Acelon Mattel. It's one of the, it's a functioning steel mine. It provides a hell of a lot of jobs in the area. Um, but relatives are not allowed onto this site for health and safety reasons. And, and there's an ongoing um, debate in the local community about how to allow people to, to recognize this site. And, and part of the that debate is now focusing around this digital model and the idea that can a digital replica, millimeter perfect replica of a space, act as a, in some way as a temporary place for people to leave their respects, to visit, to, 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 to kind of um, use as some sort of communal memorial act. And it's something that we don't know whether it's the right thing to do, whether it, in, um, whether it hinders the case for actually a, a true memorial and access to that site, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's provoking those conversations. Okay, um, oh, this is, I've, I've not put these two projects uh, next to each other before, this is much more lighthearted, uh, so Just take a little second there, um, probably good to lighten the mood a little bit. Um, I, I popped this in, it's a very recent project, it's actually still on show in the new museum in uh, New York. Um, it's a collaboration with a Brazilian artist and um, on the one hand when we first got this commission I was super uninspired. Um, Danielle wanted to do an Oculus Rift environment with us, put point clouds inside an Oculus Rift. Um, I kind of imagined that the Oculus Rift and this VR experience was just going to be incredibly cheesy and just wasn't going to float my boat and the studio were kind of a little bit undecided about it. And, when we first got one of our point clouds into this environment, it was absolutely insane. It, it works, um, the, the fact that the world in, in a point cloud is made up of points, you just feel absolutely free to swim through everything and you don't, the, uh, a, a solid wall doesn't feel like an obstacle when it does in a normal kind of virtual reality environment. So you can actually have an amazing amount of fun just kind of wandering through these, these spaces. So the, the project, as you'll see, is, um, it's a fragment of Brazilian rainforest taken into an art gallery in, in London. And, and, and the kind of slight technical um, uh, achievement of the project, I guess, as well, is that we've got a fully tracked space here as well. So you've not just got the kind of head movement, but you can wander around a kind of 10 meter square area and, and have that little experience. And the music's from the Jungle Book. <laughs> So I think um, actually 
although the experience of that piece is, is really quite, um, quite beautiful to, to, to take part in, it, the conversations that have happened in the studio when people come in and try it on are actually the most fascinating things. Just by overhearing somebody like screaming out that they're in the middle of a tree, or that, and, and just watching people grab for things that aren't there, and this kind of discontinuity between digital virtual reality worlds and the physical room that you put people in, starting to play with that is a hell of a lot of research about giving people um, kind of fake objects that correspond to digital objects. And I think that's one of, for me, one of the most interesting kind of areas around the, the virtual reality conversation. Um, and actually, and also being able, um, controlling people's experience externally from them, so moving them not in relation to how they're moving in the space, suddenly flying somebody up into the air is just an incredibly kind of disconcerting experience, but, but quite, um, kind of quite uplifting and beautiful as well. Okay, I'm going to start touching now on, on work that's going to head towards the, the workshop that myself and Thomas are going to be running next week. Um, and I guess this kind of establishes a little bit more our critical um, take on the technology that we use. So on the one hand, we get projects like this. Um, this is a two meter by one meter um, egg for the window of Harrods, which is a kind of fancy department store in, uh, in London uh, that was having original Fabergé eggs, which are kind of tiny little fellas like this that are worth millions and millions of pounds, uh, projection mapped onto them from a series of, of something ridiculous like 24 projectors, like this mad kind of high profile project. And the egg is uh, digitally fabricated. Um, it should be perfect. And they're throwing all the projections onto it and it doesn't match. Um, so what we've done here is, is scan the egg and, give the, and, and work out actually that the CNC machine that made it is slightly miscalibrated in one direction. So giving them a proper model of what this egg is like, they, they managed to map their Fabergé eggs happily and everybody uh, had a nice Easter. Um, but I mean, one of the, you know, so we, lo we do these projects and actually technically they're, they're fascinating things to do in the office and, it, and it's really pushing the technology to be as accurate as it possibly can be. But in doing that, we also discover all of its kind of inherent mistakes and the tendencies for it to, you, you, you master how it works and therefore you're able to master how to make it not work so well as well. Um, so these are very, very early scans from when we first loaned, loaned a piece of hardware from one of the manufacturers um, and essentially set ourselves the task in, this is the original scan lab, it was hiring an art gallery space <coughs> for a week and inviting people to come and play with this machine. And, it turned into just me and Will trying to scan the unscannable, basically. So this is, uh, you can see in the background here, this is the remnants of a massive cloud that was built in that room there, tied in with a big piece of um, plastic. Then we released the plastic and watched this cloud kind of unfurl in front of the scanner and scanned a cloud, which the manufacturers had told us was impossible. Um, small controlled explosion in the box in front of you, and again, scanning the, the resultant cloud from that. Um, Big mirrored surfaces are the nemesis for a, for a scanning machine, basically a complete kind of um, incongruity between what it sees and what is actually there in space. So what you're looking at here is a scanner on the one hand scanning half of a room very successfully. On the other side of the room it's scanning actually a big curved piece of mirrored perspex. So what it's doing, the, the, the machine is a dumb object. It's pointing in this direction and it takes a measurement. But what it's seeing in that, in that direction is actually a, a reflected surface. So it gives a very accurate distance of a reflected surface, but it positions it in the wrong part of space. Um, it's something that we first noticed accidentally from road signs. Uh, road signs actually, or depending on the, on the infrared spectrum that you're using, road signs can actually have perfect bad reflectivity. You can end up with road signs offset kind of exactly 100 meters, exactly 250 meters, something like this. Um, and in a weird way, actually, this image, um, which, was, which was created probably four or five years ago, is very, very similar to the workshop that we're hoping to run on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but in a much kind of, uh, this is a very analog approach. You take a physical object, we, we try and battle the scanner against it. What we'd be doing um, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is actually that same process, but in a much more digital and slightly more kind of prescribed way, I guess. Uh, this project um, was a collaboration with a, with a couple of theatre professionals as well that occupied a series of spaces in this building. Um, and it played on some accidental reflections. This is uh, somebody scanned as they're crying in front of a mirror, but actually what's happening here is that the scanner is scanning itself in the mirror. So um, 
on the mirrored surface, it doesn't appear particularly good, but actually you end up with a scan of the tripod and reflected a spatial reflection of the person. We're now looking at that same space in, in plan view, so the original image was taken from that direction. Um, so a pretty perfect spatial reflection of the scanner offset into a space, which in this instance is actually um, a narrow corridor and then a solid wall that happens here. So this ability to start to know and understand how the technology works and then to start to create these, um, these spaces that don't exist, they only exist inside the scan and they only exist inside that one moment of the scan. Um, the, the time element is not something I've spoken so much about in the scanning, maybe I'll come on to that in a bit, but um, I think we kind of become big believers that these scans are moments as well and they, are, they quite often, they're, they're very heavily framed, they're quite often heavily staged and they can sometimes never be repeated. That might be something like a art piece like this with, a, with an actor involved, but it might also be an exhibition that is only on for a week and, and then disappears and this, the ability to eke out those moments in perpetuity. Um, allied to that project as well were a series of, of, of much more de heavily designed instruments, um, mirrored reflective surfaces that would um, take people in a very controlled experiment from a position <coughs> inside this room to a series of positions outside the room in this void space four stories up. So the result of that was people scanned in a room um, ended up kind of levitating and, and performing these magic tricks in the space beyond. So this series of digitally fabricated mirrors on the wall, you can see the, all of those reflections from the central eye view of the scanner and then this resultant series of people that are essentially levitating three or four stories up. <coughs> we did have quite a good habit of doing one of these semi um, projection type drawings for most of our significant projects. It's something that slipping a little bit, but it's quite nice to later on go and um, using, using some of the drawings that have gone into the making of that project, but also um, this kind of map making uh, ideology of, of turning all of that three dimensional information into one final flat thing that can exist on, on a piece of paper is, is something that we, some, we try and do in the office, we don't always achieve. Okay, um, this is a little intro to noise then, so noise, error in the void, which is the exhibition that we're going to be setting up tomorrow and Friday and that will open next Thursday evening. Um, noise takes two single scans from Berlin, captured um, in November 2013. Um, they're both half an hour scans, they both um, are single scans and the, the crucial thing about these scans is that we've dug into the software and removed all of these inherent um, tendencies for the machine to correct its own mistakes. So the manufacturer's idea of all of, all of these machines is that they, they capture a hell of a lot of information. Some of that information is erroneous. They, they come up with algorithms to ditch out all of, the, all of that erroneous data so you only see the truth, the good stuff. Um, noise does away with any of that um, <coughs> automatic selection process and it takes it back to the scanner, believing single-mindedly that it can see absolutely everything. So you end up with these, um, these two scans, both of which are maximized out at the spherical range of the scanner. So in this instance, it's, um, it's 105 meters, I think, from the center of scan to the edge there. There's a point in every possible position in these scans. The scanner does not believe it's made any mistakes. So what you get in the, in the first instance, this is Oberbahn Bridge next to, um, next to the river, the, the Spree, in, in, um, which Thomas points out he's lived in Berlin, that it's actually a kind of super cheesy tourist spot to go and scan. Like the Oberbahn Bridge is just this classic cheesy, it's like me scanning Big Ben. Um, and, what, and, and yet we've produced this, this um, image that will be a film down in the exhibition space that, that kind of barely represents Oberbahn Bridge. What it instead represents is these, these echoing shadows of um, a big tall glass building that sits next to Oberbahn Bridge. Um, and the erroneous data that comes from trying to scan a moving river and the erroneous data that comes from this highly polished stainless steel handrail that's about a meter and a half away from the scanner. All of these things that um, we placed the scanner there predicting that that glass building was going to be a nightmare for the scanner and that the moving water was going to be a problem. 
The second site is um, Tempelhof Airport, which is uh, used to be Berlin's main airport, is now a massive flat expanse that's been given to the city as a park with a single rule really that you can't develop anything on it. So it will remain big and flat and open. And we're talking absolutely enormous. So the scanner is sat in the middle of the runway here with nothing to see. It's got a, an empty horizon line. Within its range, there is it, almost nothing to scan. And yet you get these kind of amazing echoes of reflections off the markings on the runway. And this 3D scanned sky, which is the, the kind of closest to um, an impossible thing to scan. I'm only going to let this play for a little bit because these are the animations that will be on show downstairs. So you'll have two big screens running in parallel with these perpetually orbiting objects and this kind of quite epic soundtrack. Um, I just want a sky scan. Yeah, so you end up with this, this perfectly scanned sky, this three-dimensional version of the sky with color information from the clouds and all of these kind of objects floating in a space that is knowably essentially empty. Shall I, should we, should we switch, shall I do this no, one? I think so, is it? Yeah, is that cool? I'll do five more minutes and then we'll do five minutes about the workshops. Sounds great. Is that cool? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, um, series of projects that involve humans. Um, and um, for immediately, I mean, again, those early tests when we were scanning the smoke and the, literally the smoke and the mirrors, um, uh, we were also having a conversation with um, a guy called uh, Tom Lomax about um, about life drawing um, and we set up some tests some very very simple tests where artists were life drawing and we were scanning simultaneously at the same time um, what, what happened in those tests was we scanned some naked people relatively well if they stood still which life models tend to do quite well um, it quickly spiraled on into a project which isn't here yet um, uh, so fast forward in time those, those very successful scans of, of stationary people actually turned into this which is a photo shoot with the fashion designer Vivian Westwood. Um, it's a photo shoot, though, crucially, with no cameras involved. Um, nobody else knew that there weren't going to be any cameras involved apart from us that day. So the makeup artist did makeup. Uh, so they, they, everyone arrived on set. There were no cameras. There was us with our strange machine. And we kind of gave a kind of two-minute description of what this thing does and then let everybody kind of deal with the consequences of that. And there were some interesting consequences. For example, the makeup artist doing this incredibly over-the-top makeup, which she believed was makeup for LiDAR. Um, just under no kind of instruction from us that LiDAR needs different makeup than a, a camera, which is kind of quite fascinating. Um, so you end up with these um, very, very staged moments of portraiture. The, um, the venue becomes incredibly important not least of all because I'm actually getting married in this venue in uh, November now as well, which is kind of strange. Um, but um, so you're not just framing a photograph. Everything behind the camera is equally as important as, as what's in front of the camera. So the position where you would expect the photographer, you would expect the flashlights to be, is now occupied by this kind of void of where machine used to be. Um, and you have this ability. I mean, th for me, this film should be played out over the course of an hour. These should be portraits that sit on a wall and and move almost unnoticeably, almost unperceivably. Um, and then this creepy moment from behind where you're getting this perfect anamorphic um, view that people look perfect from, from behind in the scan because you're seeing this map of the, you're seeing the back surfaces of the map of the front of their face. A uh, similar project actually led to, um, this is a music video which we created for a band called Ebay who uh, just kind of kicking off for them really, they've been signed to XL Recordings which is uh, Radiohead, XX, they only have about 16 artists, they're all awesome. Um, so Ebay are hopefully going to be awesome too. Maybe I'll play a little bit of that. Not the greatest start to a track I don't think.
Um, so this is a project that was a, a alluding to slightly earlier actually, um, which started out as essentially life drawing, life scanning, but became very quickly this experimentation with what happens when you move at the pace of, of, a, of a LiDAR scanner. So LiDAR is essentially moving um, left to right or, or clockwise if you're looking in plan view, um, a bit much like an early um, camera would do, a slit, a slit camera. Um, so what we're doing here is, is initially curating these movements of life models to be perfectly timed with the pace of the scanner. So if, you set a, if we do a quick scan, they move quicker. If we do a two hour scan, they have to move agonizingly slowly. Um, it results in these kind of quite incredible and distorted images, which at, at this stage in the project um, were inside a dungeon, uh, former, um, the former prison dungeon of this place underground in, in Clerkenwell. Um, and again, myself and, and the guys at Scanlab had this original conversation about what do we do with these kind of beautiful fragment, fragmentary moments and our immediate reaction was that we wanted to make these pieces again. Um, so the idea being that these, these captured fragments in time would become sculptures at one-to-one -one in cast in, in metal um, that would then be interacted with, ideally by the original person that was, that was in that scan. So you're interacting with this former version of yourself. It's a project that's actually reaching fruition now in a collaboration that myself and Thomas have been working on with a dance company called New Movement Collective, um, who are not these naked people, because they are professional dancers. Um, but um, uh, so it, it's, it's received some funding from the Barbican Arts Centre in London. Um, we, we did a first kind of R&D performance, and I'll show you some of the, some of the sculptures that were made for that, um, which was in November last year, and we have a second round of funding, um, which is going to see us hosted by the Art Gallery in the Barbican for a couple of weeks to do some live fabrication of the next stage of this. But we have some small cast metal prototypes, experimenting with various ways of making these things to become real-life objects that <coughs> the dancers will then interact with again um, in an on-stage performance. So this is a snapshot um, of Clemmy, one of the dancers, dancing with, uh, at this stage, this is a laser cut and resin, uh, laser cut MDF and then resin coated one-to-one -one, uh, sculptural fragment that will probably be spray coated with metal as a, as a kind of prototype for the real things, which we would like to see made by <coughs> spray casting um, molten metal into a, into a robotically fabricated uh, foam mold, which is then burnt off and polished up. Um, just play a wee bit of this intro video.
So the project became this performance, which was all about um, archaeologically rediscovering these people who, who were the dancers who were reactivated into life, um, but also simultaneously discovering these former versions of them, which were either projected films or, uh, or sculptures on stage. Um, and I think that's about as much as we've got in there. Cool. I think I might uh, have, get Thomas to join me up on stage. Uh, Thomas is uh, one of the guys, uh, let's play in the background. Uh, Thomas is one of the guys that's uh, been working for us for nearly a year now at ScanLab. Um, he graduated Bartlett School of Architecture last summer. Um, and various interesting historical and design routes to, to coming to join ScanLab. Um, and Collapse in particular is one of the projects that he's been working on and will be working on the uh, workshop and the um, gallery exhibitions mm -hmm. over the course of next week. So I think we're going to start off actually by mm. showing... Mm. Um, we're going to show just two, a couple of documentary videos from previous workshops which we've done. These are <coughs> three or four day workshops um, that have happened on location in, in the UK. This is actually a four or five day workshop, I guess, so kind of the scale of what we're going to be doing here and also, I guess, the size of output we can get, or the quality of output we can get. What's this? The task on this workshop was um, a relatively simple one really, it's a filmmaking exercise um, and the students were given this um, incredible landscape of Kielda um, in Northumberland in the UK um, to explore, to find uh, a location um, and then to curate a three minute um, animated movie complete with soundtrack that was presented in a public viewing about um, three days after they'd ever really first come into contact with a, with a laser scanner. Um, it's an incredible landscape. It's, it's one of Europe's, or I think it is Europe's largest um, maintained forest. So it's a fully planted and harvested forest. Um, and a series of four different animations that came out of that project. This one here took you on a, a, a continuous plan and sectional view through a fabricated landscape. Mm, which is quite interesting because it doesn't only reflect realistically a landscape, but you can actually start grafting point clouds together and kind of create these kind of fictional narratives through a uh, supposedly veracious uh, medium, which is quite interesting. kind of got out of the habit of slow shots of scanners rotating now. <laughs> We're done on that. Um, we just show one other one quickly and maybe we'll talk over this quite a bit as well. Yeah, um, this, this one is actually really interesting and quite relevant for uh, the workshop we're going to do here as well because uh, what we did in this workshop, and this was actually before I joined, but um, the scanner would normally sit on its tripod and rotate around, but it, what it's actually doing is taking slices through landscapes. You can also keep it stationary and then put it on, for example, a car and then drive through the city. The problem of that becoming that um, the scanner doesn't know where it is. If it's in one position, it knows everything exactly from that origin. And that's kind of something we took up, I guess, creatively in the, in the sense that the path along which the point cloud was then mapped uh, became something that you could actually draw. So you, so you would draw a curve be it circular, kind of trying to imitate the actual path um, the students followed, um, and then map that uh, data. So what, what we're actually doing is kind of warping coordinate systems in a way, and exchanging coordinate systems for these non-mimetic, like non-mimetic mappings, I would say. 
So, and the way that these um, these journeys were mapped, so the, the spatial information is being captured incredibly accurately, but then the students were charged with un their, their understanding of their place in time and space. Um, so they would write, they would vary, somebody would be filming, some people would just be taking notes, writing down this story of their day's journey, and then trying to spatialize that as a vector in time, um, and, then implant, and then kind of implant the three-dimensional information onto that. So you ended up with mm. some incredible um, kind of creative takes on mobile mapping, which is, I mean, people do this professionally every day, people spend half a million dollars setting up a mobile mapping rig and then go around perpetually mapping the world when we're completely uninterested in doing that. Mm. Much more interested in, uh, <laughs> in these magical worlds. It's easier and more interesting to do it in this way. <laughs> <laughs> so w each of our journeys as well was actually guided by a kind of expert. So the guy that took us along the canals was this guy that had been running boats on the canals for 35 years. And the guys that drove us around London were a couple of um, black cab drivers from East, from East London who just like give the most amazing, completely biased narrative on London life and politics. So, okay. um, Matt and Thomas, do you guys yes. want to, because um, we, um, we'll have to wrap up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah this was actually the last we thing. Actually, rather than having, you know, a conversation, since, since you guys are going to be here a while, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe you might focus on right now some next steps, a little bit more about the practical of the workshop. Yep. Yes. Like, um, yeah. Also, um, mm. Thomas and Matt, actually, this is the first time they've been here. So I'll send you guys, uh, right? right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it so is. So you guys uh, really yeah, yeah. interested in doing some site visits on yeah, the absolutely. weekend. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so part of the, what you're really interested to do here in preparation for the workshop is also to do some, you know, get some awareness of what, some, what the, the area is like, mm. and make some trips to the border and so on. Yep, so absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah. But I think um, also what you're also really interested in is to have a conversation with the students who are involved to sort of also think about what are the really interesting possibilities that people might be interested in working on together and, yep. you know, yeah, and, yeah. and, and start the conversation. So, so it might be a good moment to kind of just talk about maybe um, it's just to know like who is going to be in the workshop and maybe kind of segue into a little bit more practicalities about yeah, how yeah, to yeah. organize things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Does yeah. that sound good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that sounds fantastic. Uh, does that sound good for everyone? Yeah. Mm. So who's so who? Please stay if you're doing the workshop afterwards. Um, cool. Yeah. That sounds Thank perfect. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks very much.